Sophie and Josh followed Skathetch through Hecate's home. There were reminders everywhere that they were inside a tree. Everything, floors, walls, and ceilings, was wooden, and in places, little buds and shoots of green leaves dappled the walls, as if the wood was still growing. With her hand resting lightly on her brother's shoulder, Sophie looked around. The house seemed to be composed of a series of circular rooms that flowed, almost imperceptibly, into one another. She got glimpses as she and Joss passed them. Almost all of the rooms were bare, and most of them had tall, red-barked trees growing through the center of the floor. One room, off to the side and much larger than the rest, had a large oval-shaped pool in the middle of the floor. Startlingly, large, white-flowered water lilies clustered in the center of the pool, giving it the appearance of a huge, unblinking eye. Another room was filled entirely with wooden wind chimes dangling from the branches of its red tree. Each set of chimes was a different size and shape, some etched and carved with symbols, others unadorned. They hung still and quiet until Sophie looked into the room, and then they slowly, melodically began to rattle together. It sounded like distant whispers. Sophie squeezed Josh's shoulder, trying to attract his attention, but he was staring straight ahead, forehead creased in concentration. Where is everyone? Josh asked finally. There's only Hecate, Skethatch said, those of the elder race and solitary creatures. Are there many still alive? Sophie wondered aloud. Skatatch paused by an open door and turned to look back over her shoulder. More than you might think. Majority of them want nothing to do with the human eye and very rarely venture from their individual shadow realms. Others, like the Dark Elders, want to return to the old ways and work through agents like Dee to make it happen. And what about you? Josh demanded. Do you want to return to these old ways? I never thought they were that great, she said, then added, especially for the human eye. They found Nicholas Flamel sitting outside on a raised wooden deck set into a branch of the tree. Growing horizontally from the tree trunk, the branch was at least ten feet across and sloped down to plunge into the earth, close to a crescent-shaped pool. Walking across the branch, Sophie glanced down and was startled to see that beneath the green weeds that curled and twisted in the pool, tiny, almost human faces peered upward, mouth and wide, eyes wide open. On the deck, five high-backed chairs were arranged around a circular table, which was set with beautifully hand-carved wooden bowls and elegant wooden cups and goblets. Warm, rough-cut bread and thick slices of hard cheese were arranged on platters, and there were two huge bowls of fruit, apples, oranges, and enormous cherries, in the center of the table. The alchemist was carefully slicing the skin off an emerald green apple with a triangular sliver of black stone that looked like an arrowhead. Sophie noticed that he had arranged the green skin into shapes that resembled letters. Scatty slid into the seat beside the alchemist. Is Hecate not joining us? She asked, picking up a piece of cut skin and chewing on it. I believe she is changing for dinner, Flamel said, slicing off another curl of skin to replace the piece Scatty was chewing. He looked over at Sophie and Josh. Sit, please. Our hostess will join us shortly and then we'll eat. You must be exhausted. I am tired, Sophie admitted. She'd become aware of the exhaustion a little earlier, and now she could barely keep her eyes open. She was also a little frightened, realizing that the tiredness was caused by the magic of the place feeding off her energy. When can we go home? Josh demanded, unwilling to admit that he too was worn out. Even his bones ached. He felt as if he was coming down with a cold. Nicholas Flamel cut a neat slice from the apple and popped into his mouth. I am afraid you will not be able to return for a little while. Why not? Josh snapped. Flamel sighed. He put down the stone arrowhead and the apple and placed his hands flat on the table. Right now, neither Deed nor Zamorican know who you are. It's only because of that that you and your family are safe. A family? Sophie asked. The sudden thought that her mother or father might be in danger made her feel queasy. Josh reacted the same shock, his lips drawing to a thin white line. D will be thorough, Flamel said. He is protecting a millennia-old secret, and he will not stop with killing you. Everyone you know or have come into contact with shall have an accident. I'd hazard a guess that even Bernice's coffee cup will burn to the ground, simply because you once worked in it. Bernice might even perish in the fire. But she has nothing to do with anything, Sophie protested horrified. Yes, but Dee doesn't know that, nor does he care. He has worked with the Dark Elders for a long time, and now he has come to regard humans as they do, 
as little more than beasts. But we won't tell anyone that we've seen, Josh began, and no one would believe us anyway. His sentence trailed away. And if we didn't tell anyone, then no one will never know, Sophie said. We'll never speak of this again. Dee will never find us. But even as the words were leaving her mouth, she was beginning to realize that it was hopeless. She and Josh were as trapped by their knowledge of the Codex's existence as Nicholas and Perry had been. He would find you, Flamel said reasonably. He glanced at the warrior maid. How long do you think it would take for Dee or one of the Mardigan spies to find them? Not long, she said, munching on an apple skin. A couple hours, maybe. The rats or birds would track you, then Dee would hunt you down. Once you have been touched by magic, you are forever changed. Flamel moved his right hand in front of them, leaving a faintest hint of pale green smoke dangling in the air. You leave a trail. He huffed a breath at the green smoke, and it curled away and disappeared. Are you saying we smell? Josh demanded. Flamel nodded. You smell of wild magic. You caught a whiff of it earlier today when Hecate touched you both. What did you smell then? Oranges, Josh said. Vanilla ice cream, Sophie replied. And earlier still, when Dee and I fought, what did you smell then? Mint and rotten eggs, Josh said immediately. Every magician has his or own distinctive odor, rather like a magical fingerprint. You must learn to heed your senses. Humans use but a tiny percentage of theirs. They barely look, they rarely listen, they never smell, and they think that they can only experience feelings through their skin. But they talk. Oh, do they talk. That makes up for the lack of use of their other senses. When you return to your old world, you will be able to recognize people who have some taint of magical energy. He cut out a neat cube of apple and popped it into his mouth. You may notice a peculiar scent. You might even taste it or see it as a shimmer around their bodies. How long will the feeling last? Sophie asked, curious. She reached out and took a cherry. It was the size of a small tomato. Will it fade? Flamel shook his head. It will never fade. On the contrary, it would get stronger. You have to realize that nothing will ever be the same for either of you from this day forth. Josh bit into an apple that had a satisfying crunch. Juice ran into his chin. You make it sound like it's a bad thing, he said with a grin, wiping his mouth with his sleeve. Flamel was about to respond, but glanced up and suddenly came to his feet. Scatthatch also rode smoothly, silently. Sophie immediately stood, but Josh remained sitting until Sophie caught his shoulder and pulled him up. Then she turned to look at the goddess with three faces. But it wasn't Hecate. The woman she had seen earlier had been tall and elegant, middle-aged maybe, her hair cut in a tight white helmet close to her head, her black skin smooth and unwrinkled. This woman was older, much, much older. The resemblance to Hecate was there, and Sophie guessed that this was her mother or grandmother. Although she was still tall, she stopped, stooped forward, picking her way around the branch, leaning into an ornately carved black stick that was at least as tall as Sophie. Her face was a mass of fine wrinkles, her eyes deeply sunken in her head, glittering with a peculiar yellow cast. She was completely bald, and Sophie could see where her skull was tattooed in an intricate curling pattern. Although she was wearing a dress similar to the one Hecate had worn earlier, the metallic-looking fabric ran black and red with her every movement. Sophie blinked, squeezed her eyes shut, then blinked again. She could see the merest hint of an aura around the woman, almost as if she was exuding a fine white mist. When she moved, she left tendrils of this mist behind her. Without acknowledging anyone's presence, the old woman settled into the seat directly facing Nicholas Flamel. Only when she was seated did Flamel and Scatthatch sit. Sophie and Josh sat down also, glancing from Nicholas to the old woman, wondering who she was and what was going on. The woman raised a wooden goblet from the table, but didn't drink. There was a movement in the trunk of the tree behind her, and four tall, muscular young men appeared, carrying trays piled high with food, which they sat down in the center of the table before backing away silently. The men looked so alike that they had to be related but it was their faces that drew the twins' attention. There was something wrong with the planes and angles of their skulls. Foreheads sloped down to a ridge over their eyes, their noses were short and splayed, their cheekbones pronounced, and their chins receded sharply. The hint of yellow teeth was barely be visible behind thin lips. The men were bare-chested and barefooted, wearing only leather kilts onto which rectangular plates of metal had been sewn, and their chests, legs, and heads were covered with coarse red hair. 
Sophie suddenly realized that she was staring and deliberately turned away. The men looked like some breed of primitive hominoid, but she knew the differences between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon, and her father had plaster skulls of Osteopalachius, Pe Peking Man, and the great apes in his study. These men were none of those. And then she noticed that their eyes were blue, bright blue, and incredibly intelligent looking. They're Torg Alta, she said, and then froze in surprise when everyone turned to look at her. She hadn't realized she had spoken it out loud. Josh, who had been staring suspiciously at what might have been a chunk of fish he had forked out of a big bowl of stew, glanced at the backs of the four young men. I knew that, he said casually. Sophie kicked him under the table. You did not, she muttered. You were too busy checking out the food. I'm hungry, he said, then leaned across to his twin. He has the red hair and piggy nose as I gave it away, he remembered. I thought you'd realize that. It would be a mistake to let you hear them say that. Nicholas Fomel interrupted quietly. It would also be a mistake to judge by appearances or to comment on what you see. In this time, in this place, different standards, different criteria apply. Here, words can kill. Literally. Or get you killed, Skathach added. She had piled her plate high with an assortment of vegetables, only some of which were familiar to the twins. She nodded in the direction of the tree. But you're right, they're torque out in their human eye form. Probably the finest warriors of any time. They will be accompanying you when you leave here, the old woman said suddenly, her voice surprisingly strong from such a frail-looking body. Flamel bowed. We will be honored by their presence. Don't be, the old woman snapped. They will not accompany you solely for your protection, but to ensure that you really do leave my realm. She spread her long-fingered hands on the table, and Sophie noticed that her fingernails were each painted a different color. Strangely, the pattern was identical to the one she had noticed on Hecate's nails earlier. You cannot stay here, the woman announced abruptly. You must go. The twins glanced at each other. Why was she being so rude? Skatthatch opened her mouth to speak, but Flamel reached over and squeezed her arm. That was always our intention, he said smoothly. The late afternoon sunlight slanting through the trees dappled his face, turning his pale eyes into mirrors. When Dee attacked my shop and snatched the codex, I realized I had nowhere else to go. You should have gone south, the old woman said, her dress almost completely black now, the red threads looking like veins. You would have been more welcome there. I want you to leave. When I began to suspect that the prophecy was beginning to come about, I knew I had to come to you, Flamel continued, ignoring her. The twins, who were following the exchange closely, Notice how his eyes had flickered briefly in their direction. The old woman turned her head and looked at the twins with her butter-colored eyes. Her wizened face cracked in a humorless smile that showed her tiny yellow teeth. I have thought about this. I am convinced that the prophecy does not refer to human eye, and especially not human eye children, she added with a hiss. The contempt in the woman's voice made Sophie speak out. I wish you wouldn't talk about us if we weren't here, she said. Besides, Josh said, your daughter was going to help us. Why don't we wait and see what she has to say? The elderly woman blinked at him, and her almost invisible eyebrows raised in a silent question. My daughter? Sophie saw Skatas's eyes widen in surprise, or warning, but Josh pressed on. Yes, the woman we met this afternoon. The young woman. Your daughter? Or maybe she's your granddaughter. She was going to help us. I have neither a daughter nor a granddaughter. The old woman's dress flared back and read in long sheets of color. Her lips drew back from her teeth, and she snarled some incomprehensible words. Her hands curled into claws, and the air was suddenly filled with the citrus scent of lime. Dozens of tiny spinning balls of green light gathered in the palm of her hand. And then Skatthatch slammed a double-edged dagger into the center of the table. The wood split in two with a thunderous snap that spewed splinters into the air, and the bowls of food shattered to the ground. The old woman reared back, the green light dribbling from her fingers like liquid. It ran hissing and spitting down the branch before sinking into the wood. The four Turk Alta were immediately behind the old woman, curved scythe-like swords in their hands, and three more of the creatures in their boar shape burst through the undergrowth and raced up the branch to assume positions behind Flamel and Scatty. The twins froze, terrified, unsure of what just happened. Nicholas Flamel hadn't moved, 
he merely continued to cut and eat the apple. Scathatch calmly sheathed her dagger and folded her arms. She spoke quickly to the old woman. Sophie and Josh could see Scathatch's lips moving, but all they could hear was a tiny, mosquito-like buzz. The old woman didn't respond. Her face was an expressionless mask as she stood and swept away from the table, surrounded by the Torque Alta guards. This time, neither Flamel or Scathatch stood. In the long silence that followed, Scathatch stooped down to gather some of the fallen fruits and vegetables from the ground, dusted them off, and popped them into the only remaining unbroken wooden bowl. She started to eat. Josh was opening his mouth to ask the same question Sophie wanted to an answer to, but she reached under the table and squeezed his arm, silencing him. She was aware that something terribly dangerous had just occurred, and that somehow Josh was involved. I think that went well, don't you? Scatthatch asked eventually. Flamel finished the apple and cleaned the edge of the black arrowhead on a leaf. It depends on how you define the word well. Scatthatch munched on a raw carrot. We're still alive and we're still in the Shadow Realm, she said. Could be worse. The sun is going down, our hostess will need to sleep, and in the morning she'll be a different person. Probably won't even remember what happened tonight. What did you say to her? Flamel asked. I've never mastered the elder tongue. I simply reminded her of the ancient duty of hospitality and assured her that the slight to her was unintentional and made through ignorance and was, therefore, no crime under the elder laws. She is fearful, Flamel murmured, glancing toward the huge tree trunk. The Torque Alta guards could be seen moving inside, while the largest of the boars had remained outside, blocking the doorway. She was always fearful when the evening draws in. It's when she is at her most vulnerable. It would be nice, Sophie interrupted, if someone told us exactly what just happened. She hated it when adults talked amongst themselves and ignored any children present. And that was exactly what was happening now. Skatatch smiled, and suddenly her vampire teeth looked very long in her mouth. Your twin managed to insult one of the Elder Race, and was very neatly turned into green slime for his crime. Josh shook his head. But I didn't say anything, he protested. He looked at his twin for support as she quickly thought over his conversation with the old woman. All I said was that her daughter or granddaughter has promised to help us. Skathatch laughed softly. There's no daughter or granddaughter. The mature woman you saw this afternoon was Hecate. The old woman you saw this evening was also Hecate. And in the morning, you'll meet a young girl who is Hecate as well. The goddess of three faces, Flamel reminded them. Hecate is cursed to age that the day. Maiden in the morning, matron in the afternoon, crone in the evening. She's incredibly sensitive about her age. Josh swallowed hard. I didn't know. No reason why you should have, except that your ignorance could have gotten you killed, or worse. But what did you do to the table? Sophie asked. She looked at the ruin of the circular table. It was split down the middle where Scatty had cut it with her knife. The wood on either side of the split looked dry and dusty. Iron, Scatty said simply. One of the surprising side effects of the artificial metal, Flamel said, is its ability to nullify even the most powerful magics. The discovery of iron really signaled the end of the Elder Race's power in this world. He held the black stone arrowhead. That's why I was using this. The Elders get nervous in the presence of iron. But you're carrying iron, Sophie said to Scatty. I'm next generation, not pure Elder like Hecate. I can bear to be around iron. Josh licked his dry lips. He was still remembering the green light buzzing in Hecate's palms. When you said turned into green slime, you didn't really mean... Scatthatch nodded. Sticky green slime? It's quite disgusting, and I understand the victim retained some measure of consciousness for a while. She glanced at Flamel. I cannot remember the last person to cross one of the others and live, can you? Flamel stood. Let's hope she doesn't remember in the morning. Get some rest he said to the twins. Tomorrow is going to be a long day. Why? Sophie and Josh asked simultaneously. Because tomorrow, I'm hoping I can convince Hecate to awaken your magical potential. If you're going to have any chance of surviving the days to come, I'd have to train you to become magicians. <laughs>